pretty much on time. So um, let me welcome everybody to the first colloquium of the winter quarter. And we are really fortunate to have our own Kent Irwin giving today's talk. Uh, his title is Searching for Axion Dark Matter Below a Micro EV, the Dark Matter Radio. And Kent is a leader in precision measurement and exploiting in particular quantum mechanics to make major practical improvements in constraining basic parameters in physics. So there's a lot of talk about quantum theory and it's very interesting conceptually. He makes great use of it very, very concretely. And the applications of this range from early universe dynamics, the origin of structure in the universe um, to late universe dark matter, which is related to the, today's subject and even to things like biological molecules. Um, it's a wonderful development and Kent is at the forefront. He serves as the director of the Hansen Experimental Physics Laboratory, and he came back to Stanford as a pro professor of physics following a, a decorated early career at NIST, and that followed his, his PhD research here at Stanford. It, uh, his work, Kent's work has been recognized by numerous awards, including from the APS, a, a fellowship, and, and the Joseph F. Keithley Award along with a, a Department of Commerce gold medal, United States Department of Com Commerce 2012. Um, and this kind of interface between conceptual aspects of quantum physics and really practical uh, results uh, involving detection methods is a really important subject. And, and like I say, Kent is, is really leading this drive. So I'm very happy to introduce him for today's talk. Um, we want to ask you, encourage you to ask a lot of questions. Zoom is kind of alienating, as we all know. Um, and Kent has indicated that he's happy for interruptions. Um, and with that, let me just say, take it away, Kent. Excellent. Thank you very much, Eva. It's, it's great to get a chance to talk um, about all the stuff we're doing here and to uh, uh, see some of my colleagues. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking, as, as Eva said, about uh, searching for axionic dark matter. Uh, in particular, uh, a, a range of axion dark matter masses that has not been well probed before, which is masses below microelectron volt. Um, and uh, I'll be getting to all the different uh, uh, graphics that are on this first page. Um, let's see if I can successfully advance. Okay, yes. So the dark matter radio collaboration I wanted to highlight first. Um, it's actually a collaboration of a number of different institutions at this point. Uh, it's generally supported by uh, Gordon Betty Moore Foundation and Heising Simons. And also it has uh, uh, a lot of support from both Slack and Stanford and then have collaborators at Berkeley, Santa Clara, uh, uh, MIT and University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. And it really has a home in both KIPAC and HEPL as well. So there's a large list of collaborators here. Probably uh, I'd like to highlight the, uh, the, the local Stanford grad students who have been doing core work um, who include uh, Stephen, Stephen Kinsner, um, Katie Van Essendelft, uh, Joe Singh and also Nicholas Rapidus. Um, got, and we've got several postdocs here as well. Uh, uh, Patty Ho and, and Fedra Kadrabazic and um, uh, uh, Maria uh, Simonovskaya. So, but there's a lot of other people involved, but it's good to, to highlight the people who are doing a lot of the, the cool work. So what I'm going to be doing is talking, first of all, the kind of obligatory introduction to, you know, what do we really know about dark matter? What is dark matter? I'll keep that quite brief because um, I'd like to get into the stuff that I'm more excited about and talk about the different kinds of dark matter and really amongst all the zoology of dark matter candidates that, that we all hear about, there's really, in a sense, only two types, either particles or waves. You can, you can break it down that way. Then talk in particular about one of the most highly favored possible candidates for dark matter, along with WIMPs, which is the QCD axion, and then the, the, then the DM radio experiment family, um, including looking far into the future and what's already been done um, and talk about the niche that each one of these serves as we develop all the techniques we do, we're, we're going to be doing to, to really search over QCD axion space. And one of the neat things about searching for axionic dark matter is if you're looking for a simple model of single component axion dark matter, that in fact, the technology is emerging to the point where the simplest models, we should be able to scan to cover the entire mass range and do a complete search for these simpler candidates. And that's a, that, that's a rare and precious thing. And it's also something that will not be possible without quantum acceleration, unless we want to take thousands of years. So it's a great uh, example of where the new techniques of, of, of quantum uh, mechanics are really critical. Um, so I'll talk about, in particular, um, how do you electromagnetically couple to axions and, and, and describe how, in fact, there is 
for a single moded circuit, there is an optimal circuit to uh, search for axionic dark matter. You can, you can demonstrate that. And then we're in the process of actually building these circuits that are optimized against that fundamental analysis. And then talk about how we're really gonna need to be able to evade standard quantum limits to, to, to really complete the search. So I'll talk about our work with quantum sensors for axion searches. Okay, so how do we know the dark matter exists? You know, most people in this audience are very familiar with this, but I'll just hit two of the kind of highlight um, examples. One, the, the, of course, the historical reason why we know dark matter exists is that, you know, galaxies rotate more quickly than you would expect, given the amount of mass that we can measure and see in them. Um, and uh, if you just do a simple, simple analysis with basically Newtonian mechanics, you find out that the rotational velocity, uh, which you have on the y-axis here, is much, much higher, especially as you get further out from the center of the galaxy than you would expect from the visible disk. And one possible interpretation of that, which is what we believe, is that there's actually a lot more mass than what we see in, the gal in, in, in galaxies and in clusters of galaxies, um, which is uh, what we've referred to as dark matter. And in fact, there has been a decades long effort with really excellent work with some, some uh, very, very uh, uh, um, large, large teams and individual contributors to try to directly identify and detect dark matter. So far to no, to no final uh, proof. Now, why do we believe that this is stuff instead of just, uh, you know, just modified gravity or something like that? And of course you can do exotic models, um, but in fact, there's a lot of evidence that's pretty suggestive taken all together that dark matter seems to be an actual substance. Dark energy, which you may have heard of as well a lot, is something that we know a lot less about what it might be. But dark matter, it seems to be stuff, it seems to be non-baryonic, not made out of the stuff that our tables and air is made out of, not made out of protons, neutrons, electrons, or photons. Um, and one example, elegant example of that demonstrates this is you know measure, measurements that could be taken of clusters of galaxies that pass through each other and kind of like the, the headline example that people usually point to is the bullet cluster. And the basic idea here is um, if you have two galaxy clusters, which would be like this, this uh, blob on the left and the blob on the right, um, they could be broken down into components um, that we know are baryonic ordinary matter because we can see it from x-ray measurements and from visible light measurements. And this is a false color image of, of the baryonic matter in these particular clusters. Um, and, but you can also just look for the total amount of matter, not just by the galactic rotation curves, but by lensing, bending of light around that matter. And that is inferred uh, by lensing measurements. And you can see that the blue false color image is where the total matter is. And what you see here is in these, the case of these two different clusters, there seems to be some separation uh, between the dominant dark matter, the blue, the, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the plasma of, of baryons that are, that are illuminated in the x-ray here. And what we believe has happened is that two galaxy clusters have passed through each other. And when that happens, the dark matter doesn't interact very much or else we'd be able to detect it, it keeps on going the stars would actually keep them going because they're dense and point and, 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 and occupy small space. But in fact, the plasmas, the large amounts of matter that's made up of, of just inter, uh, plasmas filling the galaxy would tend to uh, incur friction and be held back. And the fact that it seems like dark matter can be separated from other kinds of matter really suggests that it's stuff. Of course, people build models and work away around it. We're gonna proceed from this point on assuming it's stuff. Okay, and we know from a bunch of other measurements, including like uh, CMB measurements have been really critical, that's really about 85% of all the matter in the universe is believed to be this dark matter. And only 15% is the normal sorts of matter that we understand. And then there's also this major component of the, of the mass in, or of the energy in the universe, which is dark energy that we're not gonna discuss. Okay, so. So one of the things that's been very frustrating about dark matter is that really the only thing we know for sure is that it interacts gravitationally and that it interacts very, very weakly with ordinary matter or else we would have been able to detect it. Um, and there's many, many different models, but they can really all be separated into two classes um, just by their mass. And that would be dark matter that tends to behave like a wave and dark matter that tends to behave like a particle. And this is really a simple argument we, one thing we know about dark matter is how much of it there is. 
because we can measure it with many different techniques. And so if you assume the dark matter is just made up of one thing, a single component to make everything simple, um, then you can do a calculation and see that knowing what we know about, about how uh, a dark matter fits into the universe, fits into, these, the, into, uh, into galaxy clusters, and knowing the mass of the individual particles, you can, uh, you can determine how many of these particles there must be per quantum state. Um, and that number turns out to be, if you're above about 10 EV or so, that number is greater than one, or is less than, is less than one. And when you've got less than one particle per quantum state, it th then things start to behave like a particle. Like if you think of just an electron going through the air, it's going to be just, you know, 10, you can think of it as something that's going to scatter, be one particle per state. But if you're thinking of like, for instance, a laser or some sort of beam of light, uh, you'll often have many, many different uh, photons in a quantum state. And that will tend to behave more like a wave, although as we know that there's wave and particle characteristics of both kind. But the important thing to take away here is how you look for something that's massive tends to be different from how you look for something that's less massive. Because if it's a particle-like structure, you're going to be looking for particle-like behavior, like scattering events or absorption events and, and the absorption of individual like quanta of energy, things like that. If something's uh, wave-like, it's going to behave sort of like a radio signal, and you might use radio technology to try to detect it. And obviously, there's a lot of overlap in the middle here as well. Um, but this is the important thing, is, is that the, the, the type of dark matter that's gotten most of the press over the last decades, a weakly interacting massive particle, that's something like, uh, you know, that, we, that, that has been searched for with having something like a GeV of mass. These particles are very particle-like, and you search for them by looking for scattering events or absorption events. And with this sort of event, you know, you've got to, you, you basically make very sensitive detectors of individual events and your background is things like radioactive contamination. But if, but if you've got particles that are much lighter than that, then they're going to behave like a wave. And just like you have, uh, you know, of course, we're going to have e equals mc squared will still apply to these particles. But they're in the wave-like behavior, they'll also have a characteristic wavelength um, through de Broglie and their energy will be equal to HF. So in fact, the mass of the particle will determine the frequency that you're gonna be searching for. So instead of searching for particular scattering events, you're searching for certain frequencies of signals. Like you have an AM radio and you want to tune to find a radio station at an unknown frequency. Okay. Okay, and there are a whole zoology of possible candidates for dark matter. And there's different levels of motivation for each. But two of the candidates that really have risen up to get most of the, a lot of the attention um, are weakly interacting massive particles and axions. And this is because both of them share certain features that we as physicists like. They're both well motivated because they solve another problem in physics. So there's sort of an Occam's razor advantage there. You get to kill two birds with one stone. There's a naturalness to them, meaning that if, the, if these particles exist, you would expect them to be product, pr pr produced in the sort of abundance as we see for dark matter. You'd expect it to be around. Um, and weakly interacting massive particles have gotten really the vast majority of the investment over the last decades. There's been an, uh, really an excellent 30 year effort to produce these particles like at the LHC and also to detect them with direct dark matter searches and search for them also through cosmological constraints and things like that. And so far there's been you know, interesting things that have happened, but a lot of the interesting phase space for WIMPs has been ruled out. And it's being extended to other candidates now. Definitely still an active search and definitely still a lot of work to do there, but, but great work so far has eliminated some of the most interesting space. Now the Axion also is well-motivated and it's natural. It shares a lot of these advantages. It's motivated by solving another problem that I don't have time to go into, but it's a problem with the standard model called the strong CP problem. And it moves, re re resolves a major issue having to do with the theory of quantum chromodynamics, which has to do with really the uh, 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 dipole moments that you'd expect, which we won't get into. Um, so uh, uh, since I only have 50 minutes, uh, it also has a naturalness argument that you would expect axions if they exist to not only solve this problem for quantum chromodynamics, but to be pr produced in sort of the abundances you'd need for dark matter. But unlike WIMPs, there are phase space, parameter space of coupling, strength, and mass is largely unexplored.
Okay. So an exciting news is that technology has emerged over the last decade to really begin to, to search for the QCD axions very sensitively. And the message is that over the next couple of decades, we as a community really could put our heads together and do a complete search for at least the simplest models. Okay, so how do they interact? So you can write down the Lagrangian that describes the interaction where this term here, it just, just gives you standard Maxwell's equation, standard electromagnetism then there would be a term that would describe this extra field that you'd be searching for, this axion field um, that would describe its dynamics. And then there would be a coupling term here. And it's easiest to think about it if you just write down the modified Maxwell's equations. How would this axion field A that would be filling space, how would it interact with uh, electric fields and magnetic fields? So you can write down Maxwell's equations and you can see that this A occurs in several locations. But one of the, one of the ways that there's a coupling through this uh, coupling term between axions and uh, Maxwell's equations is this term here, which turns out to look just like an effective current density. And you notice that there's a B here and a derivative of the axion field. And what that gives you actually is that wherever you have a strong magnetic field, and typically people do a DC magnetic field, but it could be AC as well, that, that, the light, that they will generate an electromagnetic signal if there are axions um, that would be the same as would be generated by an electric current pointing in the direction of that magnetic field. So there's an effective sort of displacement current. It's not real electrons, but it will create electric and magnetic fields like there was a current. And so we know how to look for electrical currents. Okay, so how, so how do you actually search for these things? So I'm going to get into kind of a fundamental optimization, but the basic idea for how to do it, how to actually use that one term and couple uh, through a magnetic field, um, uh, coupling to an axion field and, uh, and, and producing a photon is something called the inverse Primakov effect. And the basic idea was originally proposed by Pierre Sakivi in 1983. Of, of, of searching in the microwave frequency range and building a microwave cavity, putting it in a big magnetic field. And then remember, we talked about how um, a, an axion can be converted to a photon according to, equals, uh, according to E equals HF. The, the, the MC squared mass of the axion could become an HF and become a photon. And then you look for that frequency F. Um, so I'm hearing... Failed to detect my speaker. Hang on a second. So, uh, Eva, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me at least? Yeah, okay. I can hear you. I think we can hear I you. I think my speaker's turning back on. It's a new test. My computer died. We but never lost you. It was all fine. So, okay, good. And I hear you now. The speaker came back on. Okay, so uh, so the idea of doing uh, of searching in this particular frequency range of microwaves has been now pursued actually for for, for a number of years, and kind of the, the headline experiment is called ADMX. Haystack is another very exciting experiment, and basically it operates by by tuning a resonant cavity to the frequency to a, to a cross frequency space and looking for a radio signal to emerge when you're in a big DC field. So this really only works in the microwave range where you can make these, these lumped cavities, um, but also uh, uh, Blas Cabrera and Scott Thomas in 2010 proposed doing a similar thing just with a lumped element resonator, where you could then, you can build a lumped element resonator down at a megahertz where your wavelength is far too long to build a giant cavity. Um, but, uh, but the same basic idea applies where you can search by tuning a resonator. Okay. So, um, and that's where we start, the quest for the QCD axion. So let me talk a little bit about where we want to look for axions. So it turns out that for QCD axion dark matter, um, there is a fairly wide range of masses that would be able to, for certain couplings to, between two photons, be able to solve the strong CP problem and also be able to provide, you know, fulfill the abundance of dark matter that we see. And the range is from about a pico electron, but above that um, in atom mass to around milli electron volts, a very wide range. You'll notice this is like something like uh, nine, 10 orders of magnitude and mass or so. And you compare that to all the work that's gone into searching for WIMPs, which is really focused around maybe two orders of magnitude and mass and is expanding from there, you know, getting a little bit broader. This is a very wide range. And this coupling is very, very weak. 
the amount of power that you can couple is extraordinarily small. Now, it was previously thought that the QCD action was strongly, strongly favored to be in a pretty narrow mass range of this whole range, which we'll talk about in the next couple of slides. And so the kind of headline experiments of ADMX and ADMX G2 have focused on this narrow range, which is sometimes called the classical axion window, which we'll talk about in a second. But now it's really understood that it's also strongly motivated over this entire loud range, which is terrible news because there's a whole large range to search. But the great news is the technology is emerging to be able to do that. So there's, so there's a great Peter that uh, 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 Peter Graham's group, a paper that Peter Graham's group put out in 2018 that recognized that axions can naturally be uh, generated in the abundance that we see if, uh, if they're generated in a different way. So, so this is a complicated diagram. I'll just pick out a couple of things. The y-axis on the right-hand side here is the axion mass. You can go look at the paper for the whole thing. And the x-axis has to do on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the top portion is the energy scale of inflation. And original models were just looking for axions produced by this misalignment mechanism after this period of inflation. And it turned out that there's this wedge over which this can produce the sort of abundance of, of axions that we see and be consistent with cosmological models we have. If axions are produced post-inflation on this axis, they really want to have a mass larger than about a microelectron volt, or else they would, if they, if they get, uh, would produce in overproduce and, and uh, produce isocurvature that we do not see in the universe. What Peter pointed out, and also Alan Guth's group pointed out uh, uh, around the same time, is that actually if axions are produced before inflation, with inefficient reheating, so that they just relax, that in fact, there's a much broader range of axion masses that would be able to nat naturally produce this. So this is the classical axion window, which I already mentioned. It, let me just see if I've lost my pointer here. Here's the classical axion window, which favors axion masses of about, above about a micro EV. And, and, and so post-inflationary masses really like to be there. Uh, but this pre-inflationary pre axion window naturally generates over a much larger range. And if we look at this, the top here is about a picoelectron volt. So there's this range here going from around a picoelectron volt all the way up to above a microelectron volt that could have been produced before inflation, still solve the strong CP problem, and be produced in the abundances that we see without producing uh, too much isocurvature. So that means that we can look over a much larger range. And uh, so the dark matter radio is trying to carve off a few orders of magnitude in the middle of that and address that range. And I'll now go through kind of what the components of this dark matter radio experimental family are, and then talk about how they work, how we optimize them, and how we're going to use quantum acceleration to be able to go all the way. Okay, so this is a plot showing both the sort of experiments we're building now experiments that we're planning and experiments that are in GM radio gut would be an incredibly ambitious experiment that is certainly not this decade, but we can dream. Okay, so, th so, so these sort of, of explosion plots for axions typically plot the uh, axion mass along the x-axis here. And this coupling that was back in the Lagrangian and the modified Maxwell's equations, GA gamma gamma, of how strong the coupling is between the axion and ordinary um, electromagnetism. And it turns out this yellow band is a favored band for, for uh, single component dark matter to uh, axion dark matter to also be solving the strong CP problem. And there's a couple of different models, KSVZ and DFSZ, that are these black lines within the yellow bands. And kind of the name of the game is to, is to, is to knock off these, these simpler models by trying to exclude any coupling strength any sense, you, you, which you need more sensitivity to go down, any coupling strength at or above this favored QCD axion band. And you, this green plot here is what, this may be out of date now, was done by EDMX. And their plan is to actually extend this down all the way to this bottom black line and to move up a little bit in frequency. And our, our, uh, right now we're building an experiment that will actually carve out some of this space, not quite down to the, to the yellow line. And we're also developing a design for a larger meter cube scale experiment that will cover this QCD axion band from about 200 megahertz, which is below a microelectron volt, down to around five megahertz. So it's a very, very wide range of mass compared to like ADMX. 
Okay, so this is a construction in Stanford now. This is what we're, we actually have funding now from DOE under the Dark Matter New Initiatives Program to develop, do a design study and develop a design uh, a report for this. And uh, we would love to actually start building this in a couple of years. Um, and this is the flight of fancy ambitious, not for this decade. If we built, if we got the you know large magnets, you know the sort of things that you'd like to have for CERN and really aggressive quantum acceleration, we may be able to cover this sort of range down to below a nano electron volt. Now there's other techniques that can cover other parts of this range, like using NMR spins is very exciting down at these lower masses. Um, there's lots of things that can do, but with a suite of techniques, I think we're going to be able to knock off that whole band in the next couple of decades, either through coupling to spins in some areas, photons in others, et cetera. Okay, so here is the existing parts of the DM radio experiment family, the things that we're actually developing now. There was a pathfinder that we used to demonstrate some basic techniques, DM radio 50 liter, which is now being built in the, in the physics and astrophysics building. Um, and dark red radio cubic meter. And I'll talk about each of these um, going through it. This one is sort of like, a, if I can just go like this. So the Pathfinder was built as just a demonstrator. It's actually in a lab in Varian. Um, and basically you can see that there, if you can see, there's actually these wires going down here. This is actually a wire wound inductor here with many niobium titanium superconducting wires. This is a capacitor. These are hexagonal niobium plates that fit into each other and form a parallel plate capacitor. And this was all put into this can and was read out with a DC squid, which is a classical but fairly sophisticated superconducting amplifier. Now for this Pathfinder, we didn't have a magnet. We weren't sensitive to axions. So we were searching for other types of particles, hidden photons that could also be a dark matter that I won't talk about much, but we demonstrated resonant readout and, and the basic ideas technologically to build from. Um, and we were able to actually hit, uh, uh, have a, a, a small limit on hidden photons. And we actually have a planned scan that we've been delaying now under the pandemic. We'll see where, if we actually do this scan because we're now building a much bigger experiment. So I'm not sure if we're gonna carry out that entire scan with a small thing, uh, but, but we may run in the background a bit. Okay, cubic meter or 50 liter is going from sort of a Coke can size experiment or one liter size experiment up to a 50 liter scale experiment and moving from a four Kelvin liquid helium pathfinder experiment into a dilution refrigerator and having a magnet. It's operating down at some of these lower frequencies and the purpose of this experiment is twofold. One is to carve off some axion science, although not quite getting down to the most favored models, but another thing is to be a flexible platform to demonstrate the technology, demonstrate techniques, and to test new quantum sensors, to demonstrate quantum acceleration. And we'd like to be able to develop sensors that will allow us to go much lower than that frequency, than that, that, that science range, to build future, uh, more capable experiments. And um, so uh, basically being built now. Um, and then the DM radio cubic meter experiment, which is being uh, developed under this dark matter new initiatives program is actually a classical experiment, just also just using DC squids. So not yet needing quantum acceleration, but using a magnet sort of a meter scale with sort of six Teslas, large magnet, but nothing like what they use, use at the LHC. Um, dilution refrigerator temperatures, a DC squid operating, we're assuming at about 20 times the quantum limit and would be able to cover 20 nano electron volts to 0.8 micro electron volts over a five year scan, including over for above 30 megahertz getting down to the DFSZ uh, favored model. May I ask a question? Yes. You uh, invited questions. Uh, what I don't understand is what line width are you expecting? Because sensitivity always depends upon that. And you, you showed a Q that was huge, and but you've got this huge ranges. So, so what line widths are you expecting? Very good question. And there's actually two answers to it. Actually, uh, well, first of all, I'll answer your question, then I'll answer another question you didn't ask. So, uh, so unlike WIMP dark matter, axion dark matter is not thermally generated. It's very, very, very cold. Um, so it has very little kinetic energy. It tends to be very classical. And so what that means is it's moving, it, you know, if you, it's basically, it's moving just, it's virialized in a galaxy. So it's going to be moving at something like, like uh, a, a part in a thousand of the speed of light. 
And what that means is that its kinetic energy is going to be about a part in a million of its rest energy. And what that means is the line width is going to be about a part in a million. It'll have some structure in it, and that structure will encode a lot of interesting information about how it's virialized and the early history of, of the galaxy and things like that. So that's the first answer to your question. About a, a Q of up to about a million would actually just match this axion line. It's a very narrow line. It's a very good question. So, uh, but then another point is, is if you actually do the signal and noise analysis, you keep benefiting once you actually calculated your integrated scan sensitivity and do everything rigorously, that actually you keep benefiting in signal and noise of your search by going to a higher and higher resonator Q, even if it's narrower than the Q of the signal that you're looking for. Um, and because the integrated sensitivity, which we'll get to, you can actually have sensitivity significantly away from the natural line width. So we want a Q as high as we can get. And we'd like to get a Q of a million, but, but you know, a hundred million would be even better. And so we'll see the integrated sensitivity when we get to it. Does that answer the question? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Great. Okay. So um, this is the collaboration for this uh, Dark Matter New Initiatives program, Cubic Meter, which is a collaboration between Berkeley, MIT, Princeton, um, Stanford, Slack, and Slack is Slack would be the lead lab of this experiment, and UNC Chapel Hill. Um, so um, I'm not going to talk about that because at this point it's still very fanciful and far off, but it's exciting what we could possibly do. So now to answer a little bit more about this question about, you know, how, how do you actually calculate the sensitivity? First of all, I'm going to talk about what is the optimal way to, to, to do electromagnetic detection. Um, and, and that actually motivates a little bit why you want even a higher Q than the line width. And then I'll talk about, about the sensitivity we can reach and how we can improve it with quantum acceleration and how we're doing that. Okay, so first of all, it turns out that that has been, you know, it's, it, you know, people have been searching for axions for a number of decades, and it's only quite recently that we've been able to do an analysis that actually figures out what the optimal electromagnetic circuit is to couple the axions. People were doing all sorts of things, both resonators, Sakibi's basic idea, um, and also the idea that, that, that Blossom and Scott Thomas were playing with, but also people were doing broadband things, picking up things just with an inductor. And it turns out that if you've got a passive single moded electromagnetic circuit coupling to an axion signal and you do your full noise analysis um, that there's a no number of different results and this is all in this paper that you can look down in the archive first of all the figure of merit is an integrated sensitivity across a given frequency range because you don't know where the axion is so you want to integrate all your signal and noise and optimize that um, the second thing is you'd actually expect not knowing anything about dark matter that it might be easy to find because if you calculate you know, how much dark matter there is and the speed that it's moving, um, that's, uh, and, and you, you actually can calculate that the energy in dark matter is about 10 watts per square meter. That's enough to run a light bulb. Um, but it turns out that it's it just, it's unavoidably, you have a terrible impedance to match to axionic dark matter. That, that, that you just cannot, for reasons that we discuss, couple efficiently to that. Uh, unlike an optical signal, if you're looking at an elect uh, electromagnetic signal, there are ways to match free space and, and, and impedance match and couple well to it. Um, you can also show that because of this mismatch and invoking the Bodhi-Fano criterion, which says how well you can impedance match um, certain uh, between a reactive and a real source across, across a bandwidth, you can show that broadband non-resonant measurements that are just wide have fundamentally non-ideal sensitivity, but then in fact, a single pole resonator is nearly ideal. It's about 70, 80% of the best possible circuit you could design, which might be like a multiple Chebyshev filter or something like that. Um, but you still end up coupling to only a very small fraction of the dark matter power. But the higher your Q is, the more efficiently you couple. And if you'd really want, you know, the key, the, the key that you need to efficiently couple to dark matter is in the 10 to the 20, 10 to the 30 range. So you'll never get there. But, but also most of the searching power, most of the information arises from information outside of the resonator bandwidth. So let me show you this. So suppose you're actually searching and to make it simple, I just put in the formula for a, a quantum limited amplifier, uh, an amplifier that measures both amplitude and phase with equally weighted and does it as well as quantum mechanics will allow. DC squids get sort of close, but they're not quite there. Uh, but the figure of merit for your search 
is this integrated scan sensitivity. And if you're doing, so, so from this point forward, we're just gonna assume we're doing a single pole resonator because that's 70% as good as you can do and is much simpler than building a more complex structure. So we just do that. So a single pole resonator is gonna have a Lorentzian roll off like this. And if you calculate the strength of the signal at a given frequency and all the different noise sources you put it in with a standard quantum limited amplifier, and you put in a scattering term, a scattering matrix for transmission from dark matter to the amplifier, which you can read all about in that paper. Uh, and N here is the thermal occupation number, you know, dependent on KT, plus one, that one right there is the photon you get from uh, vacuum noise and amplifying it to make it classical. With an SQL amplifier, this is actually your figure of merit. That's what you're optimizing. Optimizing that figure of merit against the bode frano criterion, as good as you can do, that's what tells you that the best you can do um, is something only a little better than a resonator. So let's talk that through. Okay, so if you've got a low frequency, we got a, a low frequency circuit, which is our which is our DM radio, which is measuring anywhere from like megahertz to hundred megahertz or something like that. It, uh, you can actually take if it's got a single electromagnetic mode, whether it's a single pole or not. You can represent it with an equivalent circuit that will have all the math that Maxwell's equations have that you need that you haven't canceled out. So you can model it um, accurately just as an inductor and a capacitor and a resistor, the irreducible loss. And this could be a mode or it could be a hand wound inductor and a physical capacitor. And then the uh, dark matter signal is going to generate a voltage across in, in, in these lower frequency ranges. It's actually a voltage in, in the inductor because it's magnetic field is your dominant signal that is generated. And then it's going to be rolled off by your resonator line shape. Um, and so there's also there's noise sources as well. There's going to be thermal noise from your resistor. And that's going to take on the same Lorentzian line shape. And you can write an equation for it here. And you're going to have vacuum noise. Quantum mechanics says you're always going to have a half a photon, depending on how you define things, in that resonator as well. And that vacuum noise will also roll off as Lorentzian. Um, and the, you can characterize the thermal noise by this thermal occupation number. Then you're going to have a readout noise, your amplifier. And your standard quantum limit says how well your readout noise can work. But here's the important thing. If you put it all together, your resonator bandwidth, which is only about three decibels wide, or it's as wide as you get from going down to half the power, is only a tiny fraction of your usable signal noise. Now, why is that you can see it this way? Suppose you're lucky and your dark matter is perfectly on resonance. It's going to ring up your resonator and in frequency space you're going to see a tone like this right there in the center of the resonator and let's say depending on the units you choose for your axes it's peaking a little bit above your thermal and vacuum noise by that ratio um, so you have to define a bandwidth for that but then say instead dark matter is actually detuned from the resonance it's a number of line widths away well the intensity of that signal is going to roll off as lorentzian but so will the intensity of the thermal noise and the vacuum noise and it turns out that you don't lose any signal and noise off resonance if you're able to deconvolve this. And depending on what frequency you're at, you can actually measure thousands of line widths and get just as much sensitivity in one line width. And in fact, going to higher Q just means you're coupling more power in. You're a better impedance match to dark matter. So we want the highest Q we can get and we get much more sensitivity. And your resonator doesn't have to move by one over Q. It can move by mid step by many line widths between data sets that you take. Okay, so that's what we call the sensitivity bandwidth. Now here's an example. Uh, Let me just ask a question yeah. Yeah. there. Um, isn't it important that the, there's a coherence length which sets a time, or is that not um, the right way to think about it? Yes. Well, I mean, there's a coherence length, and if you're talking about there's the co there's two coherence times in the problem, as you know. There's the coherence time of the resonator itself, which would be like the I guess Q over the frequency, and then there's the coherence time of the axionic dark matter, and the right. axionic dark matter has a coherence time or Q has a coherence length. Um, that will be, you know, much larger than our experiments when we're dealing down at these frequency ranges. The, the Debye, Debye uh, wavelength turns out to be very, very, uh, De Broglie. De Broglie wavelength turns out to be very, very long compared to our experimental sizes. So De Broglie wavelength is much larger uh, for these classically or non-relativistic particles than it is for the photon that they create. Um, and 
so the uh, what I've drawn here is actually the response in Fourier space. So it's averaged over many coherence times of your, of your amplifier. Okay. And when you actually go through and you calculate your integrated sensitivity, what you have to do is you um, basically as long your coherence time of your dark matter, you integrate uh, basically uh, your amplitudes are, 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 are averaging together over that coherence time. And when you go past that coherence time, then your axionic signal is wandering in phase and it's got, it's an incoherent signal. And then it's adding up um, as uh, according to the Dickey radiometer formula. Okay. So if the coherence time is longer, you have better signal to noise, but you just take what you get. Um, and you, you simply have the best signal to noise for whatever signal you have is what you're saying. That's right. Depending on, you know what the coherence time of your axionic dark matter is once you know its frequency. But in fact, to get down to the sensitivities we want, we're going to have to average for many coherence times. Um, and uh, uh, so we're averaging only, we're only gaining in signal and noise as the fourth root of time. This is why in the end you need things like, like uh, quantum acceleration, because to get down to the sensitivity we want, you very rapidly blow up from from one year to many graduate st student uh, lifetimes. Okay. So, um, so putting this together, I can already see that I'm not going to get far into how our quantum sensors work. So I'll just kind of set up set up the, uh, what they do without talking about functionally how they work because because I've gotten too much into the into the sensitivity analysis. But anyway, you get a sensitivity bandwidth which is many many um, line widths wide, and so what happens is is uh, you want to optimize your amplifier so that it can give you the best sensitivity bandwidth, not just the best bandwidth on re resonance. And typically, if you didn't have thermal noise or if you just carried about a single frequency, um, each amplifier has two terms, an imprecision noise and a back action noise. And what you would do is you tune the coupling so that they were about equal. And then you're getting down to the regime where you can be quantum limited at that one frequency. But we're down in a regime where, where, where HF is, is significantly below KT. So there's a bunch of thermal photons. Um, and the uh, thermal noise tends to be relatively high, even when you're in a Delfridge temperature. And so what you want to be able to do is keep increasing the back action by coupling your squid or some other quantum sensor uh, as str strongly, which means it gets more back action, but that means the referred and precision noise gets lower. So it turns out what you want to do is increase coupling, which increases back action and drops in precision until it turns out that the optimum, if you do the integral, is where the back action noise is at about half of the thermal noise. And then that's what optimizes your, your sensitivity bandwidth, which is set by where your thermal noise and, and, and other noise sources drop down, hit your imprecision. And until you hit these two points, your signal and noise is independent of frequency. And you've got a, a, a wide scan and you can take big steps and move fast. Okay, here's an example for the Pathfinder with one particular resonance that was a Q of 150,000. Um, this was the this was the Lorentzian. This, this is not an log log plot here, and what we measured was that the undegraded sensitivity, the sensitivity band, as you can see, was was multiple line widths here. Okay, so I'm going to really spend the remaining few minutes, um, really uh, more kind of talking about why we need quantum sensors to go forward and setting up what we want to do. And I'm not going to talk about exactly how our quantum sensors work, but I'd be happy to talk to anyone offline about that. Okay, so we have this idea that we'd like to move beyond DM radio cubic meter to DM radio to be able to go to lower frequencies, cover more space. Get it, it's called, and, and the, the notional experiment that we have in mind is DM radio gut because it gets down to the frequency range that is where the Peche Quinn symmetry breaking associated with the axion is at the scale of, of grand unification. So it's an interesting range to probe. Um, but it turns out that probing down here is fundamentally impossible without quantum acceleration, where I consider it fundamental to have to go um, uh, more than, you know, more than 10 graduate student lifetimes. That sounds to me like a fundamental limit. Um, so, so as you go further down, as you can see, these models go to lower and lower coupling. 
And so the, the experiments get more and more challenging. And this classical DM radio cubic meter experiment will be able to work down, will get to the, to the best models down to around you know, 10 to 30 megahertz. But to go lower, we're going to need to go to much bigger magnets, but also get quantum acceleration to get better than the standard quantum limit. Um, now, it's a little confusing why you'd even want to talk about using a quantum sensor when I just got off saying that these resonators are in a thermal state. And why would you ever want to measure something better than a quantum limit when you've got a thermal, a bunch of thermal photons rattling around? That seems like the, the, there's a big confusion there. But it turns out we really do need sensors that operate, operate better than the standard quantum limit. And so what I've done here is written down kind of some of the techniques that are develop, being developed now for measuring coupling to axions at different frequency ranges and accelerate these experiments. First of all, um, in the sort of gigahertz range where ADMX and Haystack are, people are developing superconducting qubits to do quantum non-demolition photon counting. And it turns out that that allows you to do a lot better than the standard quantum limit defined one way. At lower frequencies, that's totally useless. What you want to do is coherent measurements, things like squeezing and what we're exploring most strongly or developing most strongly is back action evasion. Why do we want to do this? Well, first of all, why do we not want to photon count? Because you know, when you're thinking about quantum, photon counting is often the first thing that comes to mind for some people. And the answer is, well, just the first thing we said, if you're in a thermal state, photon counting is useless. Suppose you actually have a resonator and it's got a thousand thermal photons in it. Well, you'll look once and you count a thousand photons. You look again and there's 900. You look again and there's 1100. And the fact that you can count individual photons there has not helped you at all, you're still completely limited by classical noise, just by the shot noise of those photons or the thermal uh, fluctuating in and out. Um, so you need different techniques. Okay, and the last thing I'm going to do is basically describe how we do this. I won't actually describe how our sensors work. I'm going to skip all this stuff, but here's some beautiful sensors I'm not going to describe. And here's some data showing how they work. Instead, I'm going to get to this and say, uh, what we would like to be able to do is, let me actually just motivate it by going to this. What we would like to be able to do would be to actually get rid of back action. Like we mentioned that anytime you couple strongly to a measurement, uh, quantum mechanically of two things that don't commute, you're going to measure, um, measure, if you measure both of them, you're going to introduce some irreducible quantum noise. And you can, you can, you can describe that as actually having uh, a, a measurement which is imprecision, which is an uncertainty, but also the fact that you back act, you give a kick. So for instance, if you want to measure a particle, its position and its momentum, if you measure its position perfectly, you lose all information about its position, which is the same thing as saying you must give it an impulse. It kicks and flies off somewhere. Um, same thing is true with electromagnetic signals. You can't measure amplitude and phase perfectly at the same time. But what we would like to do is have some way to still get rid of that back action. Because even if we've got a thermal source, if we actually reduce the back action, that somehow that will allow us to couple more strongly to the amplifier, which will reduce our imprecision and increase our sensitivity bandwidth. We're not going to be able to measure perfectly on resonance any better with quantum techniques than we can with classical, but we can measure many more bandwidths, many more uh, uh, line widths. And, and if you can measure 100 times farther in, in, in line widths, you actually reduce your scan time by a factor of 100. So how do we do that? How do we get to the point so that we can reduce our back action, action and then increase it? And this is the last thing I'll show. And the idea is to do this technique called back action evasion, which was really developed by Braginsky back in the 80s or 90s, I think. Um, and the basic idea is that any electromagnetic signal can actually be decomposed into two quadratures, cosine and sine quadrature. So consider this, this, this sine wave, this black uh, sine wave here, that you can represent it as a cosine term, uh, which is in blue, and a sine term in red. You add those two together with a certain amplitude and it will lie on that black line, but there will also be some noise. And you can quantum mechanically describe this as just like you can, you can use you know, creation annihilation operators. You can actually write the operator for the cosine quadrature X and the sine quadrature Y. And you plug it in and you find out that they do not commute just like P and X of a particle. You can't measure both cosine and sine perfectly the same. And in fact, if you do measure them both equally, 
you always introduce at least a half a photon of noise. And if you amplify it, you introduce another half a photon. That's required by Heisenberg. Okay, so here's the basic idea. This is the last thing that I'll show and then I'll conclude. Um, so here's what back action evasion does. Back action evasion is this technique that it turns out that if you can um, make your amplifier amplify you with a parametric amplifier, amplify one quadrature, sine or cosine, very strongly and not the other, that you can actually put all the back action into the one quadrature you don't measure and measure the other. Now it's a bit of a complicated thing because in fact, you've got all these other noise sources. So imagine that we're plotting uh, different measurements of a resonator on a phasor diagram. So we, we, me we measure the, the, the state of a resonator, the, the, the electromagnetic signal in it. We measure its cosine component and the sine component and make a dot. And we do this many, many times and we develop a cloud of uncertainty. And the red part here is the uncertainty that we get because of thermal noise. And we're adding them together. The white circle is the standard quantum limit. That is what we would get just for a half a photon, the vacuum noise from Heisenberg. And then the uh, readout introduces some additional noise, which I've drawn here as blue. Now this looks like we're not doing a lot, but we actually are. If, if you're able to make it so that you push all of your back action into one quadrature and not into the other, if you just look at it on resonance, you'll see, okay, Y is a little more when you add them all together, have, has a little bit of wider blob than X, um, but, uh, but you know, in X is a little bit less, but you still got the thermal noise, so it's not great. But if you're able to keep doing this and then keep coupling more strongly and more and more strongly, then what happens is you're able to keep pushing up your back action, reducing your imprecision, pushing up your back action, you know, getting rid of it, getting rid of it, the back action evasion, reducing your precision, and then you get a very large search range. And that's what would allow us to actually um, uh, be able to do DM radio that move towards that, which is a very challenging experiment. And we're gonna be using this also in DM radio 50 liter. So the first step towards that is to just have an amplifier that has strong gain in one quadrature and not the other. So I'll just show some data that Steven Kunstner took showing that with this sensor that I'm not even describing how it worked, his, his first measurement of it was able to get a gain that was 30 dBs almost higher in, in one quadrature than the other. So that's a first step towards back action innovation with this particular type of superconducting quantum amplifier. So anyway, I'm not gonna describe about the math about how that all works, but leaving it here, um, we, where we means the community, can now conceive of fully probing this QCD axion band, this, these simplest QCD axion models, which is really one of the most well-motivated dark matter candidates. And so we're not necessarily in a fog. We can really do this. This is gonna take a suite of instruments, including NMR-based experiments, high-frequency multimoded experiments, microwave cavities, but we also need to cover a very large range with you know, of, of, of th maybe, maybe three orders of magnitude of mass uh, with these lumped element resonators are, are kind of the exciting thing to do. And, 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 uh, to, but to get there, we're going to be able to do some work classically, cover some good models, but we need quantum sensors that can back action evade or do some other trick to do better than the standard quantum limit um, to be able to get down to the science reach. Um, and that's uh, how we hope to be able to carve off this middle chunk of QCD axon space. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kent. Let's give Kent a round of applause, first of all. That was a really beautiful talk. Um, let's, let's invite questions from the audience, um, including about the stuff that Kent had to rush through in case you were curious about any of it. We can take a little time to, to go over that as well. Any, any questions, just speak up. If, Kent, if you look at the plot on this last slide, um, the the 50 liter one, that is without assuming the um, the back action improvement. That's correct. That's uh, that that's basically what could be achieved by getting down to the standard quantum limit with a very small magnet. Okay, and so then any you, back action evasion would push us further down. Right, and you showed you can do some demonstrations of back action improvement, which would lower that sum, right? Yes. 
Um, and the, and, and even it, it turns out that being able to go down, as I mentioned before, and as you alluded to, by just integrating longer is certainly possible as well. But, but, but as you pointed out, um, uh, after you get past the coherence time of the axion, you're only going down in the y-axis as the fourth root of your time. So you really need other techniques. You need to go to bigger magnetic fields. You need to do uh, quantum acceleration. You need all the tricks you can to be able to do this pink range here um, in the future. What, what you mean by quantum acceleration is the back action? Yeah, well, back action evasion is one way to do it. Um, photon counting doesn't work at all, but there's also, you know, there's other things you could play with. There's squeezing is another thing to evaluate. Um, uh, the, uh, which were, were, were actually, you would actually squeeze all of the noise into one quadrature, not just get rid of the back action in that one quadrature. The reason why we're practically interested in doing back action evasion is we believe it's gonna be a lot easier to get to a large degree of back action evasion um, simply because you're much more tolerant of loss in your elements before you, um, before you amplify. Something that really limits how well you can do squeezing in electromagnetic systems is just you know, loss in circulators and things like that. And you're much more tolerant of that in back action evasion than squeezing. But squeezing is another trick you could do. I'm sure there's other things as well. Sorry, in both cases, you are squeezing the distribution to have more uncertainty in one direction than the other, right? Yes. Okay. You're, 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 you're squeezing your measurement, but you're not necessarily, like you're not squeezing your thermal noise into one quadrature. Your, your thermal noise just stays in both quadratures. You can actually, you could, you could try to actually squeeze your thermal noise to all be in cosine and measure sine as well. That would give you additional acceleration. Okay, let, let me ask a dumb question at this point, um, which is especially so since we had some exchange about it today, but could you say once again, what exactly the variables X and Y were in the end? I mean, you know, there are conjugate variables in the field that you already alluded to. Are X and Y directly related to those or? I, so, so, so if you think classically, it's basically there, there, there first of all, there's the two phasers um, that if you take any electromagnetic signal at a given frequency, at one, a single frequency, you can write it as a sum of a cosine and a sine with two different amplitudes. And the amplitude of the cosine would be your x quadrature, and the amplitude of, your so of the sine would be your y quadrature. So that's the classical statement. Um, th but then um, quantum mechanically, um, you can actually uh, just write with, with uh, you, you can promote the x quadrature and the y quadrature to operators. Um, and you can do that by just, uh, um, you know, take. Uh, uh, by just uh, adding them together like this. So, so you, you, you require that x hat gives you cosine omega t and y hat gives you sine omega t. You solve that and these are the formulas for those two quadratures. Then you, then you can plug them into your commentator. You find out that they don't commute and they're very much analogous to position and momentum mathematically. Right, right. Um, but what this was was the was the field, right? I mean, or- Yeah, so, okay, yeah, so yeah. that's a good thing. Suppose you have an electromagnetic resonator. This is, now I understand your question. Suppose you have an electromagnetic resonator um, and just say it's a simple harmonic oscillator, an LC oscillator, and you put it onto an oscilloscope, you see a sine wave of the voltage. Um, uh, now, if that sine wave of the voltage, if you adjust the phase, you could make it so it's a perfect cosine, or you could adjust the phase and make it a perfect sine. If you put it somewhere in between, then it's the sum of a sine and a cosine. And what quantum mechanics tells you, just like saying you can't know the position and momentum of a particle at the same time, it says you cannot know the x component and the y component, uh, the, the cosine and sine component of an electromagnetic field perfectly at one time, which is also the same as saying you can't know the amplitude and phase of an electromagnetic sine wave perfectly at the same time. Right, right. And in field theory, we might say it's just the field and the field momentum. These are all linear combinations of those, right, those right, quantities. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think I've taken enough time from the, the rest of the audience. So who, who else has a question? Everybody's being super shy. Um, So I do have a question. Um, what are the practical difficulties of actually implementing this back action evasion? 
uh, incredibly numerous, I would say. Um, so first of all, I'd say we've done the easy part. Um, the easy part is you need an amplifier that uh, will, okay, so, okay, our particular implementation turns out to be using a low frequency resonator coupled to a high frequency resonator. Um, so that the low frequency resonator modifies the frequency of the high frequency resonator, which is, turns out to be mathematically just like what LIGO does, where you have a mechanical resonator um, modifying an optical resonator, the, the basically moving mirrors around. A gravitational wave moves mirrors. It's mathematically, it's the same Hamiltonian. And what you need is an amplifier, first of all, that measures one quadrature and not the other. Um, and it turns out that this is relatively straightforward to do when you've got something like LIGO or something like what we've got, got which is a, a low frequency resonator coupled through a nonlinear element, which in this case is a Josephson junction to a high frequency resonator. And it turns out that the way you do it is you just, let's see, um, I went the wrong way. I still think this is faster than going out. There we go. Instead of exciting your high frequency resonator with a sine wave, you, put, you excite that resonator with a sine wave whose amplitude is modulated by an envelope. Um, this is what was worked out by Berginsky in like the 1980s. And you can do that by actually putting in two tones, one that's slightly higher frequency than your resonator and one that's slightly lower, and then you get a beat frequency that modulates them. So it just gives it to you naturally. And when you do this and you work out the math, it turns out that you will amplify one quadrature of your low frequency signal, which is at the frequency, you make your low frequency signal at the frequency of the envelope of the modulation. And it turns out you'll amplify one and not the other. And what the math gives you beautifully, the Berginsky worked out is not only do you amplify cosine, but not sine, but you actually happen to put all your back action into sine, but not cosine which has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, the, the, when you write the interaction Hamiltonian, there's an, there's an even, an, a term, one term that's even and averages out. What that means is the easy part is you can make an amplifier that gets really, really high phase sensitive gain contrast. And that's what Steven showed here is that, you know, without trying that hard, uh, he was able to multiply, uh, amplify this low frequency cosine signal uh, a thousand times uh, higher, 30 dBs higher than a sine signal. And that's one thing you need. Um, and that automatically gives you that you're not putting very much back action is. But now what you need to do is be able to take this signal. You need to be able to, 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 to very controllably couple it to your low frequency resonator, this device that you've made. Um, and then you need to be able to satisfy a number of, of, of problems. So one problem is, is that you, you're, you're coupling this very small superconducting device to this big old cavity. And if any of the high frequency signal from this small device gets into that cavity, there's going to be just all these different modes you're going to couple to it. And you're going to degrade the coherence of, of the high frequency device. So you need to have some ni really nice way to isolate the amplifier from the, uh, from the input signal um, with very, very high fidelity at the high frequency and have it only couple parametrically at the low frequency. And that turns out to be very easy to do if you can use lossy filters. But to make this a nice quantum protocol, you can't use any resistors. You need to do it just with symmetries of the device. That's one of the challenges. Uh, another challenge is actually that, that in the end, how much uh, uh, sensitivity improvement you get has to do with what's called sideband resolution. That you need your high frequency resonator that you're coupling to to have high Q, and you want the tone that you're exciting it at to be well separated from that, 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 that from the central tone, or else just the noise from the tone will leak in. That's another challenging thing is getting to be a highly resolved sideband. And of course, there's just all the problems whenever you're trying to do coherent things. Um, you know, having a good follow-on amplifier is challenging. All the rest of this, you know, keeping everything cold, keeping out EMI, all these things are challenging. Thank you. Kent, I have a, one quick question. Um, if we look at your final, you know, your like 
hopeful for the next decade or two decades plot. What is giving me the rough boundaries that you've estimated for like the DM gut curve? For example, why can't you go to lower masses? Uh, you it, absolutely can. Um, so because you, what you're doing is you're, scan, you're, you're, you, you're scanning a resonator, is you're, you're able to allocate your time however you, might, you want to meet your priors. Um, and uh, so in fact, that paper that I cited actually built, it presents a framework where you can build in whatever your priors you want and optimize your scan to match them. So, so what we've done here is basically chosen a set of priors um, that say that we want to go down until we hit the DFSZ line and then stop and allocate all our time to lower frequencies. Now that's not as well scientifically motivated a set of priors as it is politically motivated a set of priors. Sure. Because it turns out that's what everybody does and you don't get any credit by saying you're gonna go much lower. Sure. Uh, can I ask what is the, like when you, the, when you plug in numbers for DM radio gut, what sort of integration time are you plugging in? Is that like just a couple years? So there's a, I can point you to a, um, a snow mass white paper on this experiment that would specifically specify it. I know we pushed every parameter for DM radio gut. We did the highest quantum acceleration we could imagine. We did the largest magnet we could imagine and um, uh, uh, probably a slightly intolerable integration time. But I am not gonna remember that, but I'd be happy to point you to the snow mass paper um, or else just look it up for you. Okay. Send me you. an email and I'll, I'll poke. Well, actually, you just search search for DM Radio Gut. Um, yeah, on, yeah. On, on, I, I, I can definitely find it. Right paper, yeah. Thank you. Uh, on Google Scholar. Yeah. Great. Well, well thanks for, to everyone for that discussion. Any Anybody else? Okay. Well, you know where to find Kent. Um, and I want to thank you again for a beautiful talk and an exciting program of research. Thanks for sharing it with us. Um, and if there's no other discussion, I guess we can close close the meeting. So let's thank Kent one more time for a beautiful talk. All right, thanks a lot. Great fun to be here. Oh, that's yeah. a good one. The, cla the clapping hand is something that, that doesn't have any bad connotations, I think. Yeah, no, that's true, but that's, that's true, that's true. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> You just have to be on your toes. Well, I wish I could go out to dinner with you all, but that'll have to be some other time. Yeah, well, maybe we should just do that. Um, uh, we should remember. So um, yeah, thanks again, Ken. I actually have to run off, but I really enjoyed the discussion earlier today as well. Um, so um, yeah, take care. I'll just leave the meeting going though. So anybody else who has wants to let, you know, come down. Yeah, I can hang out for a few moments. Yeah, if, you, if you're available. Um, okay, thanks again. Thanks again. Um, thanks. Take care. So I want to say, Kent, you're incredibly articulate. <laughs> I also the talk too fast. No, it's great. The bandwidth of the information. I always yeah. listen to podcasts at 1.3 speed, which is about uh -huh. what you talk, so perfect. Okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thanks. So what's the story of the grizzly bear there? In your background, you're muted. I just, uh, um, I love bears, and I found this on the web. Uh, this gentleman who actually is a caretaker for this bear in Russia, I think, Eastern, one of the Eastern European countries, uh -huh. uh, is reading to this bear, and I loved it. So that's my background. Um, <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so, yes, it's. There's another picture of the same bear hugging this gentleman's wife. The wife is about five foot two, and this bear is, I don't know, six feet and odd. And so it's oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. It lives with them. The bear lives with them. Great story. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Okay. Okay. If no one has any other questions, I guess we could uh, pack it in now. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>